Anyway, Albert Einstein was very important. <coughs> Special relativity. We're going to talk about how he came up with the concept that there is no absolute time, what it means. And then he went on to do general relativity, which you'll only have a brief introduction to uh, later on. But it does try to connect the stuff to space and time. So he was an important person. This all started with the principle of relativity that was first uh, set down by Isaac Newton, surprisingly. And that is the, the motions of all bodies. Uh, this is too complicated. Let's do the modern version. The laws of physics take the same form in all frames of reference, moving with constant velocity with respect to one another. It's just what I told you a while ago. If you're in an inertial frame, such as a car moving down the highway at 60 miles an hour, or say it's a motorhome just for fun, you and your partner can still play catch with baseball, just like you were out standing beside the street. And so that's what we mean by the laws of physics being uh, constant in all inertial terms. If you start with that, and then add one important ingredient that Einstein added, and the reason he added this was probably because he started with this principle of relativity that the laws of physics should be the same in all inertial frames. And he saw that the equations that Maxwell had come up with for electromagnetic interactions did not transform properly so that this would be true. Those laws were different in different inertial frames. Unless the transformation in space took a particular form. Now other people might argue that Einstein did this fact because Michelson and Morley had done an experiment that showed that the speed of light seemed to be the same whether you were going in this direction and the light was coming this way on Earth or perpendicular or even the opposite direction. And Einstein probably was aware of this, but I think what was much more important to Einstein was how those equations transformed. So he took a transformation that had been created earlier by Lorentz, and he came up with a special theory of relativity. And I won't go through the equations here this morning because you'll get them later, but I'll just show you basically what the impact is. Here is me on my bicycle. I don't look quite as good as Einstein. And this happens to me a lot when I'm out. You know, people like to throw things at me sometimes. <laughs> I'm always hoping it's like a Big Mac or something. So here's a guy in a sports car going 60 miles an hour. He throws a Big Mac at me at 60 miles an hour. I'm coming this way at 20 miles an hour. So now I want to ask how fast that Big Mac is going to be going when it hits my face. Well, it hits my face. So it's a simple equation. The velocity equals the 60 miles per hour of the car plus the 60 miles per hour of the hamburger being thrown from the car, and I'm going 20 miles per hour in the opposite direction, so that adds in with a plus sign, and you get the fact that this Big Mac is going to hit me in the face at 140 miles an hour, <laughs> which I'm good at catching those, by the way. <laughs> and so this is all simple physics, but once Einstein uh, figured out how to really do the, the transformations, out the wrong color. And he did it with uh, embankments and rulers, moving train, stationary people on the ground. I'm not going to go through a lot of this. Uh, the other thing he needed was a, some way to define a simultaneous time between two clocks either here or on the ground. And the way he did that was he said you set the clocks by uh, sending out a light pulse an equal distance in both directions and setting the clocks so that when the light pulse gets there, it says, this is time zero or this is a certain time. When you do this, just through reasoning, and any of you can do it, you will find out that once you assume the speed of light is the same, whether you're on the moving train or on the embankment, that something funny is going on with the clocks. You'll also discover that something funny is going on with the lengths. They're not absolute. So neither time nor space is absolute. And you will see the details of this in, in later lectures. But so I'm going to just briefly describe the twin paradox. I like to do this because I'm an expert on twins. Turns out I'm married to one of a set of identical twins. So I consider myself an expert on the twin paradox. And there's more things in Einstein's relativity than this paradox, but we won't go into those. 
This is my wife, Marilyn, climbing a mountain. She likes to climb mountains. I used to say this is Carolyn, but it's really Marilyn too, because Carolyn doesn't like to climb mountains. She likes the beaches. So this is uh, the two of them together. And so what we're going to do here, oh, I just want to point out for later. Their birthday's August 8th, 19 something. I can't tell you stuff like that or I get my lecture censored. But it's going to be important later in the lecture. Just remember August 8th. And so what's the twin paradox? Well, you know, things are, don't always go smoother <coughs> when you're around some twins, so we're going to vote one of them off the planet. <laughs> and for the sake of my marriage, it's going to be Carolyn. I have to do it that way. And we're going to send one of, them on, one of them on a very ambitious trip. There's a galaxy that's not far from the Milky Way galaxy. And when I say not far, that just means it's the closest galaxy to our own galaxy. And it's two million light years away. So light takes two million years to get there. And it sounds like, you know, naively, if the old velocity addition things work, that it will take Carolyn a lot longer to get there than she has to live. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't like to hear that. But the way we're going to do it, we're going to see what relativity says about it. We're going to take a rocket ship, and this is a very special rocket ship. It's going to accelerate away from the Earth with an acceleration of exactly 1G. So she'll be comfortable. She'll feel like she's on the surface of the Earth all the time. It takes an incredible amount of energy, by the way. But she'll, uh, she's worth it. It's worth getting rid of her, right? So she'll accelerate 1G until she's halfway there. Then the rocket ship will turn around, decelerate at 1G until she gets to Andromeda, where she can stop, check out the beaches, whatever she wants to do. And then she'll come back the same way. So doesn't sound possible, right? But what does relativity say about this? Well, it turns out it does take a long time. This says Carolyn is more than 80 years old when she gets back. Actually, she's older than that. <laughs> she, she, quite a bit older than that, but you know, just put your own number in there because I can't do it for you. But it's possible to do this trip in a lifetime. The trip itself takes approximately 60 years when she does that. So you can go 2 million light years in 60 years if you follow that particular, particular trajectory in, in space and time. And so she's going to get back and tell Marilyn all about it. But when she gets back, she finds out that Marilyn has been dead for some 4 million years. And she can't even find anybody who knew who Marilyn was. And, you know, hair is out of style. I mean, life is really <laughs> crazy. About that. So this, this is from the theory of relativity. And I've had people tell me, oh, that's just a theory. Uh, you know, that probably wouldn't really happen. Fact of the matter is, the accelerators that I'm responsible for here at the lab get into this domain where things are going very, very close to the speed of light. And if this theory weren't correct, we would never be able to accelerate those particles to that energy because we would be putting in the wrong RF signal and everything. We have to use those equations from special relativity to know what's happening to the beam, to know what, what to do with it, because this really does work. So this is not just focus-focus and doesn't have anything to do with reality. It really is.